hello everyone. So um, by the way, uh, I do speak Chinese. So if you guys want to talk to me after that in, in Chinese, that's fine. But since I see, you know, um, other non-Chinese faces, so I, I suppose I should speak English in this talk. All right. So <clears throat> uh, my name is Michael Yuan, and uh, uh, I'm the maintainer of uh, CNCF's uh, Wasm Edge project. So um, the, the title of this talk is Run Large Language Model Agents on Self-Hosted Devices. So there are lots of questions. Why do you want to do that, and how do we do that? But before we start anything else, let's start with the demo. I think because you know, in the early afternoon, it's probably the easiest way to keep you guys awake, right? You know, that's uh, you know, to see a, a large language model running on this computer. You know, this, you know, this. Uh, when I bought this computer um, in the middle of the pandemic about two years ago, three years ago, you know, my, um, you know, my my assistant asked me, you know. Uh, how much memory do you need? Um, I said, you know, I just I only do word processing and do some writing, some code, uh, Visual Studio, and you know things like that. So I only need a very slow, uh, low configuration. The Mac is overpowered for me, and uh, that was a huge mistake because you know now we run large language model, and the one thing that needs is memory. So you know, so we had, um, so we have to have much larger computers to run large language model. But I want to show you that even with this computer, that only has a. Uh, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory that we can run a large, uh, a very capable large language model at reasonable speed. So, um, I believe this P uh, this this um, this PPT should be available, you know, um, uh, on the website soon after this talk. So, um, so I listed the command. Those the the whole process of running a large language model on your computer really fits into one PowerPoint slide. You know, that's all there is. There's four steps, right? So I'm going to go through those steps. Uh, but because I have very slow Wi-Fi here, so I will not attempt to uh, download the large language model here, right here, because you know, I made a mistake um, in KubeCon EU you know, when I asked all the audience to download the large language model and it immediately crashed the entire conference Wi-Fi. You know, because you know, each of this model is like five gigabytes, right? It's like a full-size movie, right? So, you know, um, so there, are, uh, so there are a couple of steps. The so first, um, I know it's, it's kind of fun to see, but the first is a curl command and download a script and run it through bash, okay? What it does is install uh, wasmage runtime. Uh, why do we need that? I'm gonna get to that later, but um, the very important thing to notice is that there's no Python dependency. You don't need Python or PyTorch or anything like that. The whole package is about 20 megabytes, okay? So if you think about running a large language model in PyTorch, the Docker image itself is four gigabytes to eight gigabytes, depending on what version of the GPU drivers that you have. Okay, so right here, we have 20 megabytes versus four gigabytes of stuff of, of the runtime. So the first step is download and install software, which I, I have already done on my computer. And uh, if, you have a, um, you know, if you have your laptop with you, you can, you can do that too. It's only 20 megabytes, so it won't crash the network, fortunately. And the second is, um, because this is, uh, um, because we are in China, so I want to show you uh, uh, a Chinese open source model. You know, so um, if essentially any so open source large language model works. You know, so you can do Llama 3, which we're going to show later, Llama 3.1, Gamma, um, you know, uh, Microsoft's Phi, and uh, um, but here, you know, that's um, um, in China. We also have Qianwen and um, and uh, uh, NE and you know things like that. So here we're going to initialize. Uh, a Chairman 2 1.5 billion parameter model, which is a very small model, you know, uh, and make it suitable to run on a small device or an edge device. So I can even run this not only on my laptop, but also on a Raspberry Pi device. So, you know, as, as we'll see in a minute. So the command is also very simple. It's uh, because in the first step, you, you install the command line utility called the GaiaNet. So this is a GaiaNet init give you a configuration file, and the configuration specifies where to download this file. And then the third step is where we're gonna, is, so here, let me show you the configuration file that I have just downloaded. Garnet config.json. Okay, so um, I hope it's big enough. Yeah, so you can see there's a, there's a, a hugging face link to the model, right? You know, this is a, a, oh, no, sorry. Actually, let me, let me run this command, actually, okay? Because, um, okay, so 
Now I do this. The init command, all it does is to, is to download a configuration file and look into the configuration file to see if the model exists locally. Because I have already downloaded the model, uh, the, the model file locally, so it just goes through the, the uh, configuration step without actually downloading the file, right? So you can see um, we have the chat model, which is um, chainwind to 1.5 billion parameters. And uh, we, uh, we, we tell it's the model parameters like the contact lens and you know, things like that. And then we have an embedding model. You know, if you are familiar with large language model, you need the embedding model to do search. So, you know, so the chat model, you ask a question and it answers, right? But a lot of times you need to search a knowledge base to understand what the user is asking. So that brings in all the, all, all the you know, um, an infrastructure about vector database and all that stuff. So we, there's also a, a, you know, a, a, an embedding model here to convert the uh, natural language into a vector so that you can search them later. And there's a model template and you know, there's a prompt and you know, things like that, you are help, um, you are, you are help assistant and you know, things like that. So this is a fairly simple you know, JSON configuration file. And once we have that, the next step is really easy, just to do Gaia net start. And what it does is that it loads the model file, which I have just downloaded, and with using the wasm edge runtime, um, and run the model as an API server, as a chatbot. And uh, um, after the model starts, it verifies that the model actually runs. So as you can see, it says the API server is running, and then it gives the information like that. So for this demo, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go to localhost, 8080, which is where I just started the API server. And uh, if I say chat with this node, I start the chat chatbot. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to show you right now is I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi, OK? So just to make sure that I'm not cheating with OpenAI, I'm not sending this request to anywhere else. So here, I have just, who are you? OK. The first response is always a little slow because it needs to load the model into the, into the memory, but it's still pretty fast, as you can see, because this is a fairly small model, but you know, a chainman is a really well-trained model, so it knows itself was created by the Alibaba cloud, and uh, it's designed to understand and generate human-like human -like text and all that. So let me ask a longer question so that we can see the speed it generates text, right? So plan me a two-day trip to visit major attractions in Hong Kong, okay? So, you know, it's test both the knowledge of the model and the ability for it to formulate text. As you can see, the, the speed it generates text on this lowly Mac machine, you know, that I bought over two years ago, with explicit instruction for my assistant to have the lowest configuration. It generated text faster than I can speak. Actually, a lot faster than I can speak. You know? So it generates a two-day itinerary that goes through um, those major things in Hong Kong, like the Victoria Park, you know, uh, Stanley Market, you know, stuff like that, right? So now I can say, please, please translate the trip plan to Chinese, okay? It's gonna take the trip plan and then it's gonna tr translate all the, the, the thing about day one and about day two into Chinese. Uh, again, it speaks fast. It's, it types the result faster than I can speak, right? You know, so you, that's our first demo. As you can see, I, I, I want to emphasize I'm, I'm, I'm running all this with Wi-Fi completely turned off. So it's completely running on my own machine. You know, I installed everything from scratch, and uh, you know, and uh, um, so you know, th th that's I would say I would turn back on because my my presentation is actually on Google on Google Drive. So if I keep it off, it's gonna um, you know the presentation would not work. Okay, so only four steps. You know, that's you would uh, uh, download and install runtime, download and install the, uh, the model, configure the model, and then start Gynet. In fact, let me stop Gynet for now so that not interfere with the next demo, okay? And then, um, and this, um, this node is really represent itself as a, as a chatbot application. And then you can have a little nice UI to chat with it, you know, so that's 
our first demo, you know, to have a model running on your own device and then chat with it, right? So there are some unique features about this before we dive into the technical architecture of this thing. So the first, um, as I mentioned, is lightweight. As you can see, there's no Python dependency. There's, uh, there's no uh, multi-step to install drivers and you know, all that heavyweight stuff. Say, if you want to install Python and PyTorch on this, you are looking at uh, multiple gigabytes of downloads and installation. And uh, um, for, this, for this thing, it's about 20 megabytes, so it's a lot smaller and a lot lighter. And uh, another very interesting thing about why we chose Wasm as, uh, as the underlying runtime is that it's portable across different CPUs. So, you know, um, um, I, I'm old enough to remember the old days of Java. You know, um, when people look back at Java today, they saw, you know, um, they, they feel confused by the slogan, you know, write once, run anywhere. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? You know, that's, uh, you know, um, you develop, because back then you only have the Intel CPU, right? You know, you develop an Intel CPU and run an Intel CPU. What's, what's a big deal? Um, back then, most developers have um, Windows machine to write their applications, but the server is on Linux, right? You know, so Java solved that problem. So you develop on your Linux, on your Windows machine without recompiling, without rewriting your code. You can run it on Linux. Today, we have the exact same problem with GPUs. Most developers have a setup that I have right now. They have a Mac. If you develop a, a, a AI or large language model application on the Mac, you are likely to using the Mac GPU, which is the metal framework, you know, the whole uh, Mac setup. But when you compile the application, you want to deploy it on the server, on an NVIDIA application, in all likelihood, it would not work at all. Because on the server, the NVIDIA uses a different hardware and different software drivers to use CUDA. So not only you need to recompile your application, you typically need to rewrite your application altogether, you know, in order to um, move the application from one device to another, right? And uh, we are not considering the ARM MPUs and, you know, things like that today. I think every cloud provider has their own uh, AI accelerator uh, solutions, right? You know, so that's, uh, so it is, it's a very acute problem. That's uh, application portability problems, right? So um, with Wasm, adding another lightweight abstraction layer in the middle allows you to develop on the Mac, compile to Wasm, and then forget about it. Then you just copy the file into different platforms. You know, that's something that I don't have time to demo in, a, in, a, in, a, in the 40 minutes today. You know, uh, hopefully that we'll be able to demo it in, a, in another session on Friday. You know, so we will be able to show an application that was developed and compiled on the Mac, and I just copy it, I just FTP it to uh, a NVIDIA uh, Linux device, and it's gonna be able to run there, taking full advantage of, uh, of the native GPU, right? And uh, um, the way that I showed support a wide variety of models, you know, so if you look at a hugging face, there's, um, uh, in terms of large language models, there's thousands of them. You know, so when Llama 3 first came out, you know, people on Twitter said, you know, that's, uh, um, we're gonna see 10,000 fine-tuned version of Llama 3 within this weekend. Within the weekend, it's released, and uh, that number was actually correct, you know. That's because people fine-tune those models for all kinds of purposes, to mimic certain person to speak, to make it speak like Donald Trump, for instance, you know, to make it be better at certain language, to make it better at Japanese, better, better at uh, Chinese, to have larger contact lens, smaller contact lens, to make it speak in point. You know, so there's all kinds of models that you can, um, uh, th you can fine tune with those base models and have them available on Hugging Face. And, uh, you know, so the setup that I have just shown would be able to run all those models. You just give it a link to the model file. And not only that, it can also run models like Stable Diffusion, which is, um, you know, an image generation model, and uh, Whisper, which is a um, OS to text model. So it takes the OS file and uh, do uh, and generate text for you, and uh, you, you know, and uh, uh, Chat TTS, which is uh, um, text to voice. So it's gonna uh, take a text and generate the the, um, the the voice wave file for you, right? So that's an interesting um, aspect of the the demo I have just shown is that it has a very simple and uh, transparent model management. There's no opaque uh, model repository, you know, that's you don't know where your model lives and it's magically downloaded somewhere. All the models are represented by the simple URL. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, in our case, we are using the Hugging Face URL, but if you're inside China, you can, because you're inside the firewall, you can have the um, uh, GT, you know, uh, all the, I forgot what's, uh, what it's called, you know, there's a, there's a hugging face alternative in China, which you can use. You just, all you need is somewhere to host the model file. You can use, you know, any cloud provider to host that file, right? 
So you can just download that file. And it's easily embeddable into other applications. And I've just shown that I have a chatbot application that has a UI that I have the model embedded in it, right? You know, so I can easily start that. So with that, you know, that's the demo. And, uh, you know, that's um, um, why I thought it's interesting. So let me take a step back to say, you know, why people want to run those local model anyway, you know, isn't OpenAI good enough? You know, is your open source model going to be better than OpenAI? You know, so I, I get these questions a lot, you know, um, and uh, there are actually some very, um, I think, compelling reasons, right? You know, so the first, of course, is privacy and control. You know, you don't want, say, uh, your model does financial analysts or your model writes your email. Um, do you really want OpenAI or Microsoft to know all about that, right? The second is really speed. You know, for a smaller model running locally, it's going to be a lot faster than the model that's running on the cloud on someone else's computer. Right? And the reliability. On your, on your computer, you can plan the capacity. You can make sure that the GPU is always available when you need it. You know, um, can the same can't be said by, say, a SaaS-based or cloud-based model. But I think perhaps uh, more interestingly is that um, as the model use case grow more complex, um, people have different alignment and bias requirements. So for instance, all those um, uh, OpenAI and uh, all those SaaS models are tuned to not to say specific things. You know, so uh, we use um, a large language model on, a lot internally to help our programming work. So uh, in our office, we have, a, we have a Mac Studio with uh, 190 gigabytes of memory. So we run several large uh, models that fine tune with, with, uh, with coding tasks on it. So we um, uh, connect them to our GitHub repository so that it automatically reviews all the PRs that submitted to our open source um, uh, repository and point out you know, the problem and you know, things like that. But if you use OpenAI, a lot of times uh, it would refuse to identify uh, security issues because it considers that as a risk, right? You know, as a risk to the community because it doesn't want people to give it a piece of a code and to say, uh, uh, AI, AI, please tell me how to hack it, right? You know, so it would not tell you what's the security issues that exist in the code. So, you know, so there's, so one person's alignment is another person's shortcoming. So I think for different use cases, there's a lot of things we want the model to say or to generate that is outside of what the open AI corporate people deemed to be, um, you know, to be, uh, to be appropriate, right? You know, or, you know, Entropic for that matter, or Alibaba, you know, whatever, right? You know, so, so you know, so I think there's a, there's a really strong need for, um, for people to uh, fine tune their own model, to make the model answer questions that they, they like to get answered, right? So, um, and then there's another interesting thing. I think this is, uh, this is a point from, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Andrew Ng, that's, uh, um, that he, uh, he, talk, he wrote a paper about uh, agenic models, you know, mean, agenic tasks, meaning there's a lot of tasks where you can use a single model to handle it and you, it gets, um, you know, um, certain scores. Or you can use multiple models to handle it and break the task up into, to have a large language model break up the ta task. So for instance, writing code, you can have a model to analyze, to act as a product manager, to analyze the task and have the, then break up the task into five, and then have five different models to implement each of those task, coding tasks, and then have another model to evaluate the results, you know, by acting as a QA. So, you know, to go through the agenic workflow often yields much better results than, say, a single model that's, that's, uh, uh, that is prompt in a, in a you know, um, uh, you know, so, for each of the steps, you not, not only need different prompts, but you also, oftentimes, you need different models, right? And then there's another point which I thought was interesting is that it's often uh, overlooked is that uh, there are a lot of times uh, we need, um, today's uh, uh, large language model applications over, often need uh, tight coupling between the models and the applications. Uh, what does that even mean? You know, so tight coupling means the application depend, is, has to be engineered around the model, you know, so um, a lot of applications, uh, you would find when OpenAI upgrade their model, a lot of applications break because the prompt that used to work doesn't work anymore. You know, the new model doesn't understand the specific techniques that used in the old prompt. And, uh, you know, the context window change, the, the language capability change, and all that stuff. So we believe, you know, there's a, there's a strong need for applications to be upgraded and to be, uh, to be, uh, to be embedded together with the uh, 
with the model itself, right? You know, so instead of providing the model as a sidecar service in Kubernetes, you know, like uh, like an API server, uh, we want to embed the model and the model uh, the model runtime into applications so that they can, especially for edge use cases, so that they can be distributed together. So those are some of the reasons why, you know, um, um, when I gave this talk, similar talks before, you know, people, you know, they more or less come, you know, they more or less, eh, yeah, you know, that's maybe all right, but maybe not. But you know, since then, I think there's a strong validation. You know, is that um, companies like Apple and Google has both adopted this similar type of architecture. If you look at Apple Intelligence, there is a small model that's running on the device and to treat um, you know um, tasks that it's been trained for, like the Siri type of tasks. But for uh, strong logical reasoning tasks, it offloads to the to an online model that's that's that um, that provided as a SaaS service, right? And uh, um, Google has the same thing. So this come from you know just the the Google conference that had that was I think last week, you know. So they have Gen AI solutions for Android developers, you know. So you have high performance on device on the Edge AI, that's uh, that's running on the um, on the device as a self-hosted model, and then you have a multi-model cloud-based AI model that's that's available in the cloud, right? So. And uh, here is a little um, uh, architecture that uh, the, the Google folks has published, which I thought was, um, was very interesting because that's essentially the, the, the type of applications that have been, we have been building for the last year, um, a year and a half. You know, that's, uh, so you know, we um, take all those model elements, including the model itself, the prompt, the vector database, the, um, you know, uh, all those things, and bundle them together into a tightly coupled application. And then use uh, uh, use a common portable runtime underneath them to to make them portable across different devices, right? Instead of having all those se as separate microservices, and uh, um, have them say you know you have four. Say if you have if your application is a long chain application and uh, is a microservice, the model is a, is a microservice. The vector database is a microservice. Say someday you update the long chain piece, and then. The other piece, if you don't update them, then the entire application breaks because the model can no longer understand the prompt, right? You know, so you know, so there's um, a lot of things, a loosely coupled application. Although we we like loosely coupled application in cloud native in general, but in in the current stage of model uh, large language model application development, we think this is um, there's there's a by far a stronger case to have a tightly coupled application that has the application has the model itself self-hosted and embedded into the application, right? So here's the uh, um, the tech stack. I I'm gonna go quickly. You know that's uh, so um, um, because I've mentioned those before. You know that's um, this is a CNCF project called Wasm Edge, and uh, it's a it's a WebAssembly runtime that provide cross GPU model inference services. So you know so that's uh, the basis you can think of is uh, is a uh, the CUDA of this whole stack. It's, uh, except it's not CUDA, right? You know it's uh, so we write in Rust, in Go, or in JavaScript, and then compile to Wasm. And once we compile to Wasm, it becomes cross-platform. It runs on any GPU on any driver. So that's the role of the Wasm Edge runtime. And on top of Wasm Edge runtime, we have a project called the Llama Edge. So if you consider Wasm Edge as a JVM, the uh, Llama Edge is the uh, web sphere or the web logic or JBoss, the application server. So it's an application that built on the underlying runtime for the specific task of running large language models, right? You know, so it's uh, it, um, so it provides open AI compatible API, it provides a chatbot interface, it provides connections to those agent frameworks and you know, things like that. So, it, uh, so the Llama H project is also an open source project and provides API, uh, uh, API and SDK for, for, for developers to use. So, and then at the very top of the layer, because you know, um, if you notice that the, the demo I have just shown is called GaiaNet. So it's, uh, it's, um, this is actually, it's also an open source project, but it's one of our customers, you know, so they build uh, a fully integrated application with large language model embedded in their node. So each of their, so the idea is that each person have uh, your own knowledge. So this project originated from UC Berkeley, right? You know, so one of the things, you know, I have a, you know, it's, um, so they, they have a sh um, severe shortage of teaching assistant. You know the reason why is because you know uh, I think last year there's uh, there's uh, a huge inflation in the U.S. right so the teaching assistant feel like they're paid too little so they went on a strike to say you know that's where that we demand to pay more so you know, university decided to pay them 25 percent more but cut 25 percent of them okay so so the university is a cost neutral decision but but 
the result is that they have less TA to work with. And uh, so that's where they think, you know, um, you know, perhaps we can use the best TAs from the past years and embed their knowledge into a large language model node and have them uh, help new students, right? You know, so it's a it's an integrated system with 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 its own knowledge base and with its own large language model and uh, uh, everything pieced together and using the stack that I just mentioned, you know, the the the, the water image, llama image stack that I mentioned. So that that brings us to our next demo is to enhance the model with your personal knowledge. So we have just shown the um, um, Chenwen 1.5B model. It knows about Hong Kong, it knows about you know, common sense stuff. But if, you, if I ask it something that is, uh, uh, it is ambiguous or highly specific, it's gonna hallucinate. It's gonna give me entirely wrong answers. So to solve this problem, we have, a, um, we have another four steps, right? You know, so the first two steps still is install the, uh, the, the Llama Edge software, essentially is the runtime, 20 megabytes runtime. The second, instead of installing the Chenwen 2 uh, 1.5B model, I switch to a Llama 3.1 model. I, just, I could still use the Chenwen model, but I just want to show a different model. So I, so I chose the Llama, Llama 3.1 model. But the model is supplemented with a vector database. The vector database is generated from the Samsung Galaxy S25 smartphone menu. So if you have a smartphone, Samsung smartphone, they all have a menu. The menu is about 200 pages long, right? It talks about everything about the smartphone. And uh, you, uh, unless you have a problem, you would have no idea what's, what's going on in that, in that menu, and you would not read it. So we take that menu and break into chapters and uh, generate knowledge embeddings and then supplement that into the model. So the model itself is just a standard LAMA 3.1 model. So that's what I'm gonna do, is that I'm gonna re-initialize re my GaiaNet node with this, with this knowledge base, okay? So what it does is that, uh, you know, it's, it uses the LAMA 3.1 8B instruct model, which, because we have, we ha I have already pre-downloaded locally, so it's already have it. What it does is that it's, um, um, it downloads the knowledge collection, which is the vector database snapshot I generated from the 200 pages PDF of the Samsung device menu. And uh, it automatically imports that into the vector database. As I mentioned, the vector database is, fine, is matched with the model. So the vector database is gonna generate um, context that is the right size and the right difficulty level for this model so that it can function. So with that, with the knowledge, with the knowledge, um, with the knowledge base and the model both downloaded and installed, I'm gonna do start again. So you can see the startup command become longer because it now loads the, the knowledge base as well and, no, and loads the context. So we're gonna wait for a second for it to, because this is a much larger model than the Chenwen 1.4B. So it's gonna take longer for, for, it to, um, for it to load and then it's gonna have the same chatbot UI interface that's, that I'm gonna show you, okay? So, okay, so, so now it's started. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do localhost again. 8080, load up the chatbot. And uh, just for, for the fun of it, I'm gonna turn off the Wi-Fi. And uh, now I ask a question. Can I use eSIM for this phone? Okay, so this is a super ambiguous question. What is this phone? Okay, if you, if you ask this on chat GPT, it would, never, it would not be able to answer this question at all. And uh, because I'm not specifying which phone and what's, and each phone has different requirements for eSIM and uh, you know, and also it's a very obscure knowledge and they tend to hallucinate a lot if you do that. But because I have a knowledge base backed by this model, so the model actually knows that I, the, the only context that I have, this phone refers to the Samsung Galaxy S24 smartphone, okay? And it, it goes into the menu and find out the, the um, you know, whether it's compatible with the eSIM. The answer is it is compatible with eSIM. You can use eSIM with it. But I can ask a follow-up question. How do I change the physical SIM card. Okay, so it's, it's another obscure part. It's another obscure part that in the, that's in the, 
in the phone menu, right? You know, the, the, the phone menu basically said is the nano thing, and you know, here are the steps to do that. Um, it is a little slow. You know, as you can see, even if it's slow, it's still generate text faster than I can speak, right? You know, so if I speak like this, it's about uh, three to five tokens per second. But this easily generates 20 tokens per second, right? You know, so it's give you step-by-step instruction based on that in in menu. And that is something, even if I don't turn off the Wi-Fi, you would know that chat GPT would not be able to answer because this is too obscure. You know, it's, uh, it's something, if you really ask chat GPT about it, it's gonna hallucinate and give you a bunch of wrong answers, okay? So let me turn it back on. And so this is, um, you know, so, so this is our second demo that's, uh, that talks about, you know, um, the same easy, four easy steps, you know, to supplement, change to a different model, and supplement the model with a different knowledge base. As you can see, you can supplement it with anything. You can, you know, my son did a model like that. He has a chemistry textbook, you know, so he worked with a professor, and, uh, you know, he's a, he's a middle school student. So he built a chemistry bot. That's, um, that's, so he also built an interface that in, that's in Telegram so, and in Discord. So he's still, so his uh, classmates can interact with the model and talk about, say, you know, um, different chemical elements, right? You know. So by having a knowledge base that with your model, you can have a node that's, that's uh, you know, running locally, but with your own knowledge, right? So uh, finally, I want to do uh, a final demo, which is to showcase the API capabilities, because right now we have seen one kind of application that is called chatbot. A chatbot is interesting, but you know, it's uh, but in a lot of agenic use cases, you don't necessarily want to uh, want to have the chat interaction. Although chatbot, not only on the web, you can do it on Telegram and you know things like that. But the more interesting use case is to connect the model to something real, not just to connect the model to something to, to a speech. So that is still just. Huh? Sorry, okay. It's still four steps, but instead, you know, so the first two, three steps are all the same, you know, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, start this. So what it does is that uh, it start a fine-tuned model, you know, it's, oh, sorry. But, you know, that's, um, let's go directly to the to our backup plan, you know, because I didn't download this model. I, I don't have time to, to download the entire model, but, but I have, but I have it cached uh, on my machine. So what I'm gonna do is I, I'm gonna start, uh, uh, sorry, Python, is it? Oh, sorry, I, I, my apologies, but you know, but I can show you how it works here. So <clears throat> what it does, so, so we have a full documentation, so assume that you start this model since I'm running off time. That's uh, you can configure your uh, your Python application to use this model as as an API, not as a chatbot. So in here, then it would give you a text prompt to say, you know, um, ask something. So here I say, help me write down. I'm going to fix a bug. Okay. So the Python application has an embedded SQLite database. The model gonna not respond a a human language response. It's gonna respond something like that. It's gonna re respond a JSON structure that asks the Python application to make a function call. So what the Python application is that there's predefined function called create task. So it's a to-do list application, by the way. So it sees this as a to-do item, and then it uh, it's creates an uh, entry to the um, uh, uh, SQL database locally on your computer. And then it's, um, once the tool does that, the tool results give the result okay, and then its result okay goes back to the large language model. The large language model says, I have added, so it's, it gives you a report in natural language what it has done. So you can do this over and over and add different tasks to it, and then you can check off tasks to it, so you can have a complete natural language um, interface that interacts with a local database on your machine. Through this approach, you can have, you know, we have um, people in our community to have to interact with, say, a drone that connect to my computer. So I say, please make the drone take off. It's gonna write a piece of Python code, which I gonna, which this machine gonna send that to the drone, and then the drone will take off. I gonna say, go back, to, uh, go outside of this room and see what's outside. It's gonna find the, it's gonna see the, the door is opening and go out of there and take a picture and come back, right? You know, so all those have been done, you know, that's uh, to use, to make large language model use tools, right? And all this can be done that's entirely on your own computer with the hardware that's, you know, that you have full control of, that no one will be able to, ha will be able to hack with your, with everything that's, you know, that's, um, that's, 
with your own privacy. Anyway, so you know that's uh, um, the last project that I want to mention is uh, so um, uh, a lot of people complain to say you know that's uh, this is all good, but you know there's so much command line stuff. You know I don't really you know to, can I can I get something more visual? So so there's another project in the community that is called Moshin, which is a Rust UI project that's uh, that builds a UI around the Llama Edge where you can use a UI, you know, you can do that from your Windows or your Mac computer. You can use, you can click through and download applications, and you can download models, try it, and then have the start an API server and have other Python applications to, you know, uh, to interact with it. So that's another GitHub repository. So yeah, that's it. You know, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs>